Okay, and welcome back. We have come to our final genre. We started with short stories, then we moved on to drama, then we went on to poetry, and now we're on to the novel. Uh, the novel is the most recent invention of all uh, four of the genres that we're studying. Novels first came around about the 17th century. Some people point to Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote in the early 17th century as really the first novel. The first novels written in English weren't, uh, didn't appear until the 17th century. So by comparison, the novel is new. In fact, that comes from the same Latin word nova, which means new. So what is so new about a novel? Well, first of all, novels are in prose. They're not poetry, they're prose. They're long, and they have chapters that are interconnected with each other. So it's not just one episode after another episode after another episode, and it's not a collection of short stories, but there is development of character throughout, and that's what made it new. Now, you can see that in some ancient texts, like the Iliad or the Odyssey, but those are in verse, not in prose. So the novel we're reading for this class is The Kite Runner by Khalid Hosseini. Obviously, it's impossible for me to cover a 350-page-plus book in depth, but I just want to follow up on some themes that I think are important. And I'll just read the first chapter out loud. It's very short and stop as I go along. I became what I am today at the age of 12 on a frigid overcast day in the winter of 1975. Well, I find that a remarkable statement because it's saying I became what I am today. So it presumes he knows, and we're going to later learn this is Amir talking, Amir knows who he is today. And he knows precisely the moment where he became that person at age 12, which strikes me as a young age to become the person you are to become as an adult. I remember the precise moment crouching behind a crumbling mud wall, peeking into the alley near the frozen creek. That was a long time ago, but it's wrong what they say about the past, I've learned, about how you can bury it, because the past claws its way out. Looking back now, I realize I've been peeking into that deserted alley for the last 26 years. So, and this is part of what the novel has to reveal what happened 26 years ago at the age of 12 uh, as he was peeking down that alley, the winter of 1975, that made him believe or makes him believe today that that was the moment that made him what he is today. One day last summer, my friend Rahim Khan called from Pakistan. He asked me to come see him. Standing in the kitchen with the receiver to my ear, I knew it wasn't just Rahim Khan on the line. It was my past of unatoned sins. Okay, so unatoned sins, a... a theme I want us to be tracking as we go through this novel and as you're reading it to be thinking about is the theme of redemption. How do we redeem ourselves for past sins? Unatoned sins are those that we have not redeemed ourselves, we have not atoned for, okay? And so those sins are still out there. And so he wants to kind of forget about his unatoned sins. After I hung up, I went for a walk along Spreckles Lake on the northern edge of Golden Gate Park. The early afternoon sun sparkled on the water where dozens of miniature boats sailed, propelled by a crisp breeze. Then I glanced up and saw a pair of kites, red with long box tails, soaring in the sky. They danced high above the trees on the west end of the park over the windmills, floating side by side like a pair of eyes looking down on San Francisco, the city I now called home. And suddenly Hassan's voice whispered in my head, for you a thousand times over, Hassan the hair-lipped kite runner. Okay, so we don't know who Hassan is yet at this point, but uh, we're going to learn shortly. And it's really Hassan who haunts Amir's uh, memories, right? Uh, for you a thousand times over, what does that mean? All right, well, we're going to find out. I sat on a park bench near a willow tree. I thought about something Rahim Khan said just before he hung up, almost as an afterthought. There is a way to be good again. Okay, so obviously we have a person who doesn't feel good, feels that... Uh, his unatoned sins have sort of clawed their way out of his memory into his present. And that Rahim Khan is offering him, there is a way to be good again, which presumes you're not good now or you don't feel good about yourself now. But there is a way to redeem yourself. There's a way to be good again. I looked up at those twin kites. I thought about Hassan, thought about Baba, Ali, Kabul. I thought about the life I lived until the winter of 1975 came along and changed everything and made me what I am today. So from the very first short chapter, we find out we have 
We're, uh, we'll soon find out. We have an adult man named Amir. He's living in San Francisco now. He grew up in Kabul, uh, so in Afghanistan. And the phone rings and he picks it up and clearly um, he's not feeling good about himself. And maybe for 26 years he hasn't really been feeling good about himself. Uh, but there is a chance for him to redeem himself. Probably something about this Hassan person who haunts his uh, dreams, a hair lip kite runner. Hair lip is kind of an old fashioned term. It isn't used really anymore for a person who's born with a cleft palate. Let's skip over to page six. Another theme I want us to be thinking about is this sort of disparity that has to do with class and ethnicity. Amir is a Pashtun, which means he is more of the privileged ethnicity, whereas Hassan is a Hazara. And it turns out that Hassan and his father Ali um, are servants to Amir and Amir's father Baba. And I want to trace what this means, why it's significant that uh, Amir and Hassan, in some ways, he thinks of him as his best friend, but in other ways, he's not my friend, he's my servant. Uh, how this leads to the events in the alley and then subsequent guilty feelings. Uh, in that second paragraph, in the 18 years that I lived in that house, so this is his grand house he lives in with his father, Baba, I stepped into Hassan and Ali's quarters only a handful of times. When the sun dropped low behind the hills and we were done playing for the day, so they're playing for the day, all day long they play, they're friends, right? Hassan and I parted ways. I went past the rose bushes to Baba's mansion, Hassan to the mud shack, where he had been born, where he'd lived his entire life. Okay, and so one child goes off to the mansion, the other child goes off to the mud shack. What's kind of interesting, and I, I want us to be thinking about this as we go along, is why doesn't Baba create a better space for Ali, who has been his servant his entire life? Uh, or for Hassan, why don't they create better spaces? It doesn't even really occur to them that they could have done better for these people. But it's because, they perhaps just sort of subconsciously or even consciously look down upon them because they are Hazaras. Let's skip over to page 11. So Amir grows up um, without a mother. His mother died in childbirth. And so he feels guilty about that. And he feels that uh, maybe his father sort of blames him for it. Now, you and I would say, well, that's, that's ridiculous. He, he didn't ask to be conceived. He didn't ask to be born. He, his mother died when he was being born. You can't blame the baby on that. Uh, and I think that that's probably true. But why is it that Amir feels it may not be true, that it may be uh, that Baba blames him somewhat for it? And I, I think it's maybe the way Baba is. Baba didn't create an atmosphere where Amir grew up feeling that he was uh, loved as he is. Another theme I want us to be thinking about as we read through this is the theme of unconditional love. And unconditional love, uh, it should be our birthright, that there's somebody in the world that loves us no matter what, loves us without conditions. And that usually comes from uh, our parents, right? Our parents, it's not that we can do no wrong, but there's nothing we can do that will make them stop loving us. Well, Amir grows up feeling that Baba's love is conditional, that he needs to be more like the type of son that Baba wants him to be. And so that's probably from the beginning. This is, he feels he needs redemption from the moment of his birth. He feels he needs to redeem himself for, quote unquote, killing his mother uh, and by being more of the type of son that Baba wants him to be. Amir does get unconditional love, but he gets it not from his father, not from above, but he gets it from Hassan. On page 11, we find out, Hassan and I fed from the same breasts. We took our first steps on the same lawn in the same yard, and under the same roof, we spoke our first words. Mine was Baba. His was Amir, my name. Looking back now, looking back on it now, I think the foundation for what happened in the winter of 1975 and all that followed, the 26 years that followed, was already laid in those first words. So Akmir's first word is Baba, and maybe it's because Baba is whom he adores or whom he most wants uh, love from. And Amir's, uh, sorry, Hassan's first word is Amir, which is his name. And so Hassan feels unconditional love for Amir, but Amir doesn't seem to feel unconditional love from Baba. 
And so what's going to happen is sort of the foundations is already laid in that disparity. And on page 19, following up on this idea that Baba's love feels conditional to Amir, uh, first complete body paragraph on page 19, I watched him fill his glass at the bar and wondered how much time would pass before we talked again the way we had just had. So they don't have like very many close father to son conversations. And so this was a rarity for Amir. Because the truth of it was, I always felt like Baba hated me a little. And why not? After all, I had killed his beloved wife. His beautiful princess had an eye. The least I could have done was to have had the decency to turn out a little bit more like him. But I hadn't turned out like him, not at all. So he's much more sensitive. He's much more uh, artistic. He wants to be a writer. His mother was much more into the humanities. And Baba, is he once fought a bear. So he's a big, big... A very uh, masculine man and Amir just isn't that kind of person and so you see here that Amir wishes or wants to win Baba's love but he has a hard time figuring out how to be the kind of son that Baba wants him to be because that's just not who he is okay now let's go over to page 25 and we learn about okay what what is the past Ali and Baba Page 25, Ali and Baba grew up together as childhood playmates, at least until polio crippled Ali's leg, just like Hassan and I grew up a generation later. Baba was always telling us about the mischief he and Ali used to cause, and Ali would shake his head and say, but Aga Sahib, tell them who was the architect of the mischief and who was the poor laborer. Baba would laugh and throw his arm around Ali. But in none of his stories did Baba ever refer to Ali as his friend. Here they grew up together. They seemed to have affection for each other. They played as children, just as uh, Hassan and, um, and Amir. The curious thing was, I never thought of Hassan and me as friends either. Not in the usual sense, anyway. Never mind that we taught each other to ride a bicycle with no hands or to build a fully functional homemade camera out of a cardboard box. Never mind that we spent entire winters flying kites, running kites. Never mind that to me, the face of Afghanistan is that of a boy with a thin boned frame, a shaved head, low set ears, a boy with Chinese, a Chinese doll face perpetually lit by a hair lip smile. Never mind any of those things because history isn't easy to overcome. Neither is religion. In the end, I was a Pashtun and he was a Hazar. I was a Sunni, he was a Shia, and nothing was ever going to change that. Nothing. So he can't think of Hassan fully as his friend. And I guess it's difficult if this person is also your servant to think of him as your friend. But the role, uh, again, that class and ethnicity play in this novel is really key to what happens, why Amir behaves the way he does as we progress through the novel. And on page 27, we find out about the routine. This is what the school year looked like. During the school year, we had a daily routine. By the time I dragged myself out of bed and lumbered to the bathroom, Hassan was already washed up, praying the morning namaz with Ali, and prepared my breakfast, hot black tea with three cube sugar cubes and a slice of toasted naan uh, topped with my favorite sour cherry marmalade, all neatly placed on the dining table. So while he's still sleeping, sleeping you know, later, Hassan, the servant, is already up, already doing what he's supposed to do. He's already clean and he's already made Amir's breakfast. While I ate and complained about homework. Okay, now bear in mind, Hassan doesn't get to go to school and he's illiterate. And so you hear you have Amir complaining about homework. Kind of uh, a little bit blind, right? Hassan made my bed, polished my shoes, ironed my outfit for the day, packed my books and pencils. I'd hear him singing to himself in the foyer as he ironed, singing old Hazara songs in his nasal voice. Then Bob and I drove off uh, in his black Ford Mustang, a car that drew envious looks everywhere because it was the same car Steve McQueen had driven in Bullet, a film that played in one theater for the six months. Hassan stayed home and helped Ali with the day's chores, hand washing, dirty clothes, and hanging them to dry in the yard sweeping the floors, buying fresh naan from the bazaar, marinating meat for dinner, watering the lawn. So staying home and it becomes a generational thing where it's just assumed that this is Hassan's lot in life. On the next page, page 28, sitting cross-legged, sunlight and shadows of pomegranate leaves dancing on his face, Hassan absently plucked blades of grass from the ground as, he read, as I read him stories he couldn't read for himself. That Hassan would grow up illiterate like Ali and most Hazaras had been decided the minute he had been born. 
perhaps even the moment he had been conceived in Sanyavar's unwelcoming wound. After all, what use did a servant have for the written word? Okay, which is really sort of interesting because, again, it's not Ill uh, illegal to teach him how to read. It just seems that it doesn't occur to Amir that that would be a good thing to do. I don't know why Amir can't do something more for him to, to try to make his life a better life. We talked about the mud hut before. This is, to me, sort of another example. It's sort of a cluelessness, isn't it? That just this sort of lack of awareness. He was born a Hazara. That means he has no need to learn how to read. Okay, and skipping over to page 56, one of the things that Baba and Ali have in common is kite flying. And apparently, uh, it's a thing in Afghanistan. Is um, it's a flight kind con flying contest, and as you read, whatever kite flies the longest in the sky without being cut by any of the strings of the other kites um, wins. So it's a last last man standing kind of thing. Uh, and Baba had won it, and Amir really wanted to uh, to win it. Baba smoked his pipe and talked. I pretended to listen, but I couldn't listen, not really, because Baba's casual little comment had planted a seed in my head, the resolution that I will win that winter's tournament. I was going to win. There was no other viable option. I was going to win, and I was going to run that last kite. Then I'd bring it home and show it to Baba, show him once and for all that, he had a, that his son was worthy. Imagine, A, feeling like you have to prove yourself to your father that way, and also... Uh, that it is over something as silly or, you know, insubstantial as winning a kite contest and, and then bringing home the last kite or the last kite cut. So as we are going through judging Amir and shaking our head, thinking, why don't you do something? Why don't you teach Hassan how to read? Why don't you try to make his life better? Let's also remember that uh, Amir isn't getting the kind of love, uh, the unconditional love that he should be getting himself. Then maybe my life as a ghost in this house would finally be over. I let myself dream. I imagine conversation and laughter over dinner instead of silence broken only by the clinking of silverware and the occasional grunt. He feels like a ghost in his own house and he doesn't even, there's not even conversation around mealtime. I envision us taking a Friday drive in Baba's car to Pagman, stopping on the way at Garga Lake for some fried trout and potatoes. We'd go to, to the zoo to see Marjan the lion, and maybe Baba wouldn't yawn and still looks at his wristwatch all the time. So clearly, Amir is tuned in that Baba, even when he goes through this sort of fatherly, okay, I'll take you to the zoo sort of routine, he's not really interested, and he's checking his watch the whole time. Maybe Baba would even read one of my stories. I'd write him a hundred if I thought he'd read one. Maybe he'd call me Amir Jean, like Rahim Khan did. That's a term of affection, Jean. And maybe, just maybe... I would finally be pardoned for killing my mother. So you can understand how important winning this kite contest is and then uh, bringing the kite back apparently is, is part, you know, as a trophy, is, is, is part of what he's hoping to do. He is seeking redemption and feels like if I could just do this, maybe I could get the kind of unconditional love that Ali gives to Hassan or that Hassan gives to Amir. This sort of, I will love you no matter what, because it looks like he, uh, Baba's love is conditional. You need to win Baba's love. And so that's what Amir is hoping to do. Um, and just the idea that because Baba doesn't really approve of Amir writing stories, he doesn't think that's uh, something a boy should do. He should be out playing soccer or other sports. Again, it, it's, I think it's hard for most of us to imagine. Read a story. He's writing these stories that interest him pretend to be interested, but Baba just either has no idea that he ought to be doing that, or he doesn't want to encourage Amir to become a writer. It's really hard to like Baba at this moment, isn't it? So on page 66, he wins the kite line uh, contest. Okay, and this is the greatest moment of his life. Uh, in the middle of the page there. Then I was screaming and everything was color and sound. Everything was alive and good. I was throwing my free arm around Hassan and we were hopping up and down, both of us laughing, both of us weeping. You won, Amir Aga. You won. We won. We won was all I could say. This wasn't happening. In the moment, I'd 
Blink and rouse from my beautiful dream. Get out of bed. March down to the kitchen to eat breakfast with no one to talk to but Hassan. Get dressed. Wait for Baba. Give up. Back to my old life. Then I saw Baba on a roof. He was standing on the edge, pumping both of his fists, hollering and clapping. And right there was the single greatest moment of my 12 years of life, seeing Baba on that roof, proud of me at last. Okay, so picture this moment. Again, finally, he believed that he had achieved something that Baba now is going to love him and treat him as he ought to, not just as sort of a ghost, as sort of invisible in the house. He had believed he had won this. So when we talk about what is to follow, I want you to be thinking, okay, but put yourself in Amir's position here as well. But he was doing something now, motioning with his hands in an urgent way. Then I understood. Hassan, we, I know, he said, breaking our embrace. Inshallah, uh, we'll celebrate later. Right now, I'm going to run that blue kite for you. Okay, so Hassan, I, I don't quite get the cachet if your servant is a really good kite runner, but to run the kite means to go, you know, be the one to find it when it, when it finally hits the ground. And so he sends uh, Hassan to go run the kite. Uh, he dropped his spool and took off running, the hem of his green chapan dragging in the snow behind him. Hassan, I called, come back with it. He was already turning the street corner, his rubber boots kicking up snow. He stopped, turned. He cupped his hands around his mouth. For you, a thousand times over, he said. Then he smiled his Hassan smile and disappeared around the corner. The next time I saw him, still unabashed, smile unabashedly like that, was 26 years later in a faded Polaroid photograph. Okay, so uh, this is the last time he's going to see him smile, his big smile, Hassan, the big Hassan smile. It's not going to be until a photograph 26 years later. And you and I know, okay, 26 years later is where the novel starts, right? Uh, and also he recalls from chapter one, he recalls this moment for you a thousand times over. To me, that means I love you and I will do anything for you. This is a pure expression of unconditional love. I love you. I will do anything for you. For you, I would do it a thousand times. And as you know, um, if you've read uh, all the pages up to this, um, that Hassan gets raped by SF and his gang uh, in an alley when he's running for the kite. Okay. Now, Amir shows up. Uh, has time to stop or at least interfere. If he interferes, SF is a big bully. He's, you know, uh, Amir is going to be beaten pretty badly. And so obviously Amir is fearful, but at the same time, he doesn't want his friend whom or his servant uh, to be raped. On page 77, I stopped watching, turned away from the alley. Something warm was running down my wrist. I blinked, saw it was, I was still biting on my fist, hard enough to draw blood from the knuckles. I realized something else. I was weeping. From just around the corner, I could hear Asep's quick rhythmic grunts. I had one last chance to make a decision. One final opportunity to decide who I was going to be. I could step into that alley, stand up for Hassan the way he'd set up for me all those times in the past, and accept whatever would happen to me, or I could run. This is that moment where for, for 26 years, we know he's going to be in his mind staring back down this alley, and he has a chance to make a decision what kind of person he's going to be. He became, he believes, what he is today at this precise moment. And what did he do? He ran. I ran because I was a coward. Okay, but is that really why he ran? Keep going. I was afraid of Asaf and what he would do to me. I was afraid of getting hurt. Fair enough. 12-year-old child doesn't want to be beaten. That's what I told myself as I turned my back to the alley to Hassan. That's what I made myself believe. So he has to force himself. Well, I'm running away because I'm a coward. But that's not the real reason. I actually aspired to cowardice because the alternative, the real reason I was running was that Asef was right. Nothing was free in the world. Maybe Hassan was the price I had to pay, the lamb I had to slay to win Baba. Was it a fair price? The answer floated on my conscious mind before I could thwart it. He was just a Hazara, wasn't he? And so it makes it easier for him to make the choice because he grows up believing that Hazaras are somehow inferior. And Hassan's not really his friend, it's his servant. He's his friend in every other way, except the word friend. And he treats him poorly, 
uh, and, and doesn't do the kinds of things that he should do for a friend. And so even though he isn't proud of himself, that word Hazara floats up in his brain that sort of makes it not as bad for him to run away. So if you're thinking, okay, if he's not a coward, why did he do it? Why did he run away? It's for the kite. He wants the kite and he doesn't want the kite to be destroyed or smashed up. And so that's the price he's going to pay. Uh, that's the guilt he's going to feel because instead of stepping in and perhaps being beaten up, uh, he allows Hassan to be raped, not because he's a coward, but for the sake of sticks and string and some paper, for the sake of the kite. About 15 minutes later, I heard voices running, running footfalls. I crouched behind the cubicle and watched Asef, the other two sprinting by, laughing as they hurried down the deserted lane. I forced myself to wait 10 more minutes. Then I walked back to the rutted track that ran along the snow-filled ravine. I squinted in the dimming light and spotted Hassan walking slowly toward me. I met him by a leafless birch tree on the edge of the ravine. He had the blue kite in his hands. That was the first thing I saw. And I can't lie now and say my eyes didn't scan it for any rips. Okay, so what he was looking for first, and he admits it to himself now, 26 years later, I was most important to me was that kite was okay, that that kite was intact. He comes home, page 79. It happened just the way I had imagined. I opened the door to the smoky study and stepped in. Baba and Rahib Khan were drinking tea and listening to the news crackling on the radio. Their heads turned. Then a smile played on my father's lips. He opened his arms. I put the kite down, walked into his thick, hairy arms. I buried my face in the warmth of his chest and wept. Baba held me close to him, rocking me back and forth. In his arms, I forgot what I had done, done to Hassan, or failed to do. And that was good. This is sort of a rough moment to process for me, because I know he feels very, very bad about what has happened. Uh, his friend is raped. He sees drops of blood on the snow as they're walking back together towards the, the mansion. This is a difficult moment because I also feel for Amir. This is such an important hug in his life. Uh, I hope in your life you've been hugged so many times that no one hug stands out uh, so much. But Amir, who has been hug deprived, this one so stands out in his mind. And it's his close moment, and he believes at this moment, perhaps, that the trade has worked out, that now Baba will love him and have unconditional love for him forever. And of course, as we read on, it lasted for a little while, but then things got back to normal, and he felt like a ghost in his own house again. Well, then it becomes, I think, a section of the novel where it's difficult. You know, Amir, let's not forget he's 12 years old, or he has his 13th, 13th birthday. But it's rough on him to have Hassan around. And so he sort of ignores Hassan and he treats him very poorly. Hassan says, can't we be friends again or can't we go play? And Amir, just because of the guilt he's feeling, doesn't want to have anything to do with Hassan. Uh, after his birthday, he plants money and a watch in Hassan's mud shack so that Hassan would be found guilty of theft. Uh, the money is found. Baba asked Hassan, did you steal it? And Hassan said, yes, which means to Amir, Hassan must have known that I planted it and he must be protecting me. And why is he protecting me? Well, therefore, he must have known that I knew he was being raped and I didn't do anything about it. And as a result, Ali uh, gathers Hassan up and leaves. They leave together. Uh, Baba, it's an interesting moment, says to Ali, you know, didn't I always treat you well? And I stop and think, well, not really. You let him live in a mud hut. You did nothing to improve his education, nor for his son. Uh, you treated him like you would treat a servant, maybe better in some ways, but not like a friend, not like a person you grew up with. And so when Baba says, didn't I treat you well? Perhaps the answer is no, not so well. And Ali and Hassan leave, and they are out of Amir's life now. In the meanwhile, things fall apart in Afghanistan, and uh, Baba and Amir are forced to flee. And on the way, an interesting thing happened. Um, on page 115, the, the, the truck 
that some people are trying to escape and get stopped by the Russians. The Russians invaded Afghanistan and the uh, truck gets stopped and there's a Russian soldier who is going to rape one of the women, a, a, a married woman, page 115. It's his price for letting us pass, Kareem said. He couldn't bring himself to look the husband in the eye. But we've paid a fair price already. He's getting paid good money, the husband said. Kareem and the Russian soldier spoke. He says, he says every price has a tax. That was when Baba stood up. It was my turn to clamp a hand on his thigh, but Baba pried it loose, snatched his leg away. Then he stood. He eclipsed the moonlight. I want you to ask this man something, Baba said. He said it to Kareem, but looked directly at the Russian officer. Ask him where his shame is. They spoke. He says, this is war. There's no shame in war. Tell him he's wrong. War doesn't negate decency. It demands it even more than in times of peace. Okay, so Baba sees a rape about to occur. And unlike Amir, he stands up. And this is a perfect stranger to Baba. Baba doesn't know any of these people. Okay, but Baba is the sort of person who probably couldn't live with himself if he let this occur. But in Amir's mind, he's thinking, do you always have to be the hero? I thought, my heart fluttering. Can't you just let it go for once? But I knew he couldn't. It wasn't in his nature. The problem was his nature was going to get us killed, uh, get us all killed. Okay, and so it, it's, the rape doesn't happen, and the husband kisses uh, Baba's hand. And uh, off they go, and eventually they make it to Pakistan, and then from there they make it to Fremont, California. But it's an interesting sort of moment. Amir let the rape happen, but he has a hard time living with it. I, I guess that what's being suggested here is that Baba simply could not live with himself. He would rather be dead than allow this uh, to occur in his presence. Now, as we move to the next uh, reading section, starting uh, with chapter 11, it's going to be life in Fremont, California for Amir and Baba and how they try to put a life together in a very different environment, uh, especially Baba. I want you to be thinking about how their reaction to America is different. That for Baba, um, he can never quite adjust to America. He never quite lives the, the, the life he had. He certainly doesn't live in a mansion anymore. And so the sort of life that they're living there. Also think, look at moments where it almost feels like Amir is sort of sleepwalking through life, that he's almost going through the motions of life. During this next section, I want you to be paying attention to that, the difference between how they react. Does Baba change in your mind? Does Baba become a different kind of person? Do you feel better or worse about Baba? Do you feel better or worse about Amir? And was it circumstances that changed Baba? Or does Baba maybe not change at all? We just have a better understanding of who Baba is now that he and Amir have more of an adult to adult relationship, okay? So be on the lookout for that. Okay, that's it. Don't forget to take the quiz. Bye now.